You know, it's, it's uh, more than a little ironic to be up here today. Um, you know, as the song says, when I was young, all my heroes were cowboys. And in, in fact, that, would, uh, that made my father very proud. Uh, and if I had grown up to be a cowboy, he'd be absolutely delighted. The, the truth is, I, as I stand here today in a suit and tie, president of one of the top two land-grant universities in the nation, um, <laughs> I've been a big letdown to my father, but uh, I'm, I'm going to try to get past that, uh, although it does provide, a, I think, an interesting backdrop uh, for my comments today. To provide a little more context, uh, let me repeat an excerpt from the mission and purpose of the original 1862 Moral Land Grant Act. To create a college where the leading object shall be, without excluding other classical and scientific studies and including military tactics, to teach such branches of learning as are related to agriculture and the mechanical arts in order to promote the liberal and practical education of the industrial classes in the several pursuits and professions in life. Another excerpt, this time from the New York Times in 1937 by Alfred Atkinson, the president of the American Association of Land-Grant Colleges and Universities, marked the 75th anniversary of the Morrill Land-Grant Act. President Atkinson noted, the future of land-grant colleges will be determined by the nature of the problems which come up in the areas they serve. From the present point of view, it appears as though the problems of social adjustment to the technological conditions in agriculture and industrial areas are going to require extended study and integration. Problems of production have been dealt with, and most efficiently by the colleges, the departments and the experiment stations, and now the problems of distribution and their social repercussions on the life of the people on the farm and in industry are claiming and are apt to claim a good deal of attention. Today, some 75 years after that 75th anniversary, I find President Atkinson's comments to be remarkably relevant. It goes without saying that much of daily life has changed. When he made that observation, penicillin was not in use and no one had a computer much less a smartphone in the hands of virtually anyone 10 years old or above. Can you imagine life without the ability to Google the answer to your questions? That said, it may be fair to say that change and the pace of change is more rapid than ever before, and the potential of change now seems limitless. I'll admit it's ironic that he believed that research problems had already been solved, but isn't it fascinating that he identified social repercussions as the next area of focus for our land-grant institutions. I would say that we today know how important both sides of that coin are and will remain in the future. Today, as we ponder and dissect and celebrate the enduring qualities of the Morrill Act, I want to remind us that the visionary breadth of the land-grant mission. It is often true that we spend more time discussing land-grant institutions in terms of research and I suspect that tends to conjure images of agricultural research plots or engineering challenges or a beaker in a chemistry lab. Those tangible images are a common way of understanding part of our work. It might also be fair to assume everyone shares an understanding and commitment to the balancing and complementing liberal arts aspects of a university education, but we assume so at our peril. A telling example comes from the U.S. House of Representatives, which voted in early May to prohibit the National Science Foundation from spending appropriated funds on its political science program. The Senate is likely to have a similar amendment in the next few weeks. The Consortium of Social Science Associations is working to provide information to counter this movement and is doing so with powerful examples of research contributions drawn from catastrophic events of Hurricane Katrina and the BP oil spill and how citizens reacted to those natural disasters. Notably, Indiana University political scientist Eleanor Ostrom was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economic Science in 2009 for her analysis of economic governance. These are substantial contributions to the great problems of our day and as a consequence I would argue, as consequential I would argue, as discoveries from a chemistry lab. Reciprocally, the MCAT which had eliminated liberal arts questions in 1977, will again be testing students in two new sections, psychological and social dimensions of medicine, starting in 2015. 
It's understandable that in this period of an extended economic hardship, there's a tighter focus on training for jobs, rather than the view that education is about understanding life and the world around us. When your fishing boat is sinking, you work on plugging the leak, not on pondering the meaning of the mishap. But after you find the short-term solution, you'll call on your powers of problem solving, gain from your liberal arts experiences to deal with the issues of human safety and the impact of human intrusion on lake water, your creativity, curiosity, and critical thinking skills, qualities catalyzed by a broad-based higher education, lead to ways of building a better boat, safer and more way efficient ways to fish, or new and different ways to think about the problem. More than ever, with so many kinds of holes in the bottoms of so many kinds of boats, we need people who can consider the causes, the context, and the implications of problems, not just the physical solutions. The Morrill Act may, in some circles, be best known for providing broader access to higher education. Remember that 150 years ago, the role and purpose of higher education was very different than it is today. Higher education was a means to perpetuate class barriers and uh, prepare young elites for civic and spiritual leadership of the masses. Ironically, in doing so, the American college system started off mimicking European systems and social structures that our country had been formed as an escape from. In fact, only the most privileged, and of course only white and male, enjoyed studying philosophy and religion at those nine original, and with only one exception, private colonial colleges of the day. Harvard College, now Harvard University, the College of William and Mary, Collegiate School, now Yale University, the Academy of Philadelphia, now the University of Pennsylvania, the College of New Jersey, now Princeton University, King's College, now Columbia University, the College of Rhode Island, now what we know as Brown University, Queens College, now Rutgers, and of course, Dartmouth College. In light of that, the Morrill Act was truly revolutionary in two critical respects. First, it opened comprehensive higher education to the industrial classes. It did so while widely, wisely envisioning a well-rounded higher education. Morrill himself is quoted as saying, it would be a mistake to suppose it was intended that every student should become either a farmer or a mechanic. When the design of the land-grant college comprehended not only instruction for those who may hold a plow or follow a trade, but such instruction as any person may need. Second, it opened up the unique and massive economic potential of a still very young and largely undeveloped country. That potential exceeded any of America's contemporaries of the day and would do so for well over a century to come. It goes without saying that President Abraham Lincoln and Vermont Senator Justin Morrill are icons of American education. Who doesn't recall images of Lincoln studying alone by candlelight, scratching out sums with a piece of coal on the back of a shovel? Morrill did get to go to school until he was 15, but his family could not afford to send him to college, so he too studied alone. Lincoln and Morrill wisely understood how their own desire for education could scale to all Americans. They understood that higher education could enrich and empower a battered nation in the midst of a devastating civil war. They understood that higher education was both the key to individual enrichment, but also a powerful mechanism to fuel innovation and progress. It's important to remember the unprecedented strength, not just in our own country, but relative to virtually anywhere in the world, which came from broadening the access of Americans to higher education. <coughs> It's important to realize that now, perhaps as much as ever, as we reinvent ourselves and tap into the strengths once again. Access and affordability remain important issues. The power of post-secondary education to improve the quality of life of all citizens and the financial benefits that accrue both to the individual who pays tuition, but also the society who benefits from an educated citizenry, seem so obvious to historians and economists. Given that, it's even more ironic that many seem to have forgotten it. Remembering what, a country, what made this country great will be critical to our future. Given what currently often seems like a crushing wave of popular media attention about the cost of higher education, 
we in land-grant institutions have become an even better investment in value. We need to remind students and remind parents and remind policymakers that our institutions, our tuitions are reasonable and studies show that higher education is an exceptional investment rather than, as misportrayed by the media, a cost. Particularly for land-grant institutions, our graduates are able to quickly recoup what they invest in their education and benefit personally, but more importantly, they do so while contributing to the success and prosperity of those around them. Our policymakers need to be reminded that higher, higher levels of education benefit not only the individual, but lead to broad-based economic and social prosperity, added tax revenues well in excess of those without a college education, higher levels of civic engagement, far lower unemployment, and far fewer demands on social safety net programs such as welfare, health care, and prisons. Those programs, singularly, much less collectively, cost society far more than an investment in public higher education. And sadly, studies are showing that unless we change our current trajectory, the well-educated population that is approaching retirement will not be replaced by people with similar levels of educational attainment. We are at a critical crossroad. As noticed and noted in the U.S. Department of Commerce recent report, the competitiveness and innovative capacity of the United States, the innovative performance of the United States has slipped during the past decade compared to other countries. Similarly, the National Academies Press found that U.S. leadership and technological innovation seem certain to be seriously eroded unless current trends are reversed. The accelerated pace of discovery and application of new technologies, investments by other nations in research and development, and the education of a technical workforce, and increasing competitiveness of the global economy are challenging U.S. technical leadership and with it the entire future of U.S. prosperity and security. As recently cited by the Chancellor Bob Bergino and Vice Chancellor Frank Yeary of UC Berkeley, during the last 15 years, the Korean government has invested significant resources in its universities and even shifted its national priorities to spend more on higher education. In 2009 alone, according to the Korean Ministry of Education, Science and Technology, Korea allocated $4.1 billion U.S. for higher education funding, an increase of 14% over the previous year. In 2008, Korea launched an educational capacity enhancement project which provided grants to campuses so that they can meet industrial demands for a high quality workforce. University of California System President Mark Udoff in exploring a new role for federal government in higher education, points to the Brain Korea 21 project instituted in the late 1990s and which continues to pursue improvements in research infrastructure and graduate level training. Koreans are not the only ones doing so. As our colleagues at UC also, Berkeley also pointed out, the French government announced in 2011 that they were investing more than $10 billion in endowment funding for universities to partner together to create high-level elite university systems that could compete on a global scale. Similarly, the Indian government is seeking to build 1,000 new universities and 50,000 new colleges in order to meet the demand of doubling its higher education enrollment in just the next 10 years. Just as access to higher education helped our nation achieve its course and prosper 150 years ago, some areas of our country are starting to do so again. At least on a regional level, some public leaders do get it. A growing number of areas hit hard by the economic downturn are pursuing options to draw more college graduates to live there. For example, when Dayton, Ohio lost half of its manufacturing jobs, leaders began to focus on developing and retaining college graduates, realizing that people with four-year degrees were the only path to economic development. Prior to that new approach, 24% of Dayton adults had 24, uh, had four-year degrees compared to the average of 32% in other cities in the U.S. Other former industrial cities are starting to have the same focus as Dayton. In the Great Plains states, we have prospered and enjoyed a more consistent economy thanks to our commitment both to traditional sources of prosperity as well as to diversifying our economies. As we look ahead, 
This combination of strengths makes us well prepared to meet global needs. Our traditional challenge of feeding the nation and now the increasing markets of the world will be a bigger challenge than ever before. We'll need to use advances not just in agriculture, but in all aspects of engineering and science to meet the basic human needs for food and water. Our land grant education and research will continue to expand into the studies of nutrition, genetics, plant pathology, soil science and chemistry as the foundations for meeting that challenge. What will the next iteration of the land grant ideal contribute? I believe more than anything, it will unlock the power of interdisciplinary problem solving. A deeply held aspect of our mission is to reach out to our citizens to learn their needs and work side by side with them to improve their lives. The power of land grant institutions is unique because of our commitment to extension, service, teaching, and research. Those are a combination of tools which we, uniquely with American higher education, bring to solving the challenges of those we serve. When America took the history-making step of expanding access to and practical productivity of higher education through its land-grant system, it was a turnkey event opening untapped and perhaps even unimaginable economic prosperity. As highlighted before, that led us from being a small, fragile country to, in a relatively short period of time, a world power with few, if any, peers. We're at a similar crossroad again. Will our system of land-grant universities be a part of unlocking that ne next door? Let me ask you this instead. Is there any aspect of American society better poised to do so than our system of land-grant universities? After our country's expansion of access through the various iterations of the Morrill Act and complementing service through the Hatch Act in 1887 and the Smith-Lever Act in 1914, and most recently the GI Bill, what can we do to catalyze the turning points we have created in the past? Despite historic improvements and expanding access to higher education, we need to do more. Higher education is the unparalleled key that unlocks our nation's diverse potential. I know that very personally because I am the first in my family to have graduated from college. My father was the youngest and first English-speaking member of his Italian immigrant family. They came to this country as field workers in California. By the third grade, my father was orphaned and he never finished school. My mother's family of eight, not much better off, moved from Colorado to California the Dust Bowl days. She only dreamed of going to college. Ultimately, my parents slowly built a family business on their old dairy farm. The business grew and prospered. They now enjoy sending me postcards from foreign travels and sharing just how much they enjoy spending my inheritance. <laughs> but on a very serious note, their story of hard work leading to success is unlikely to be repeated in the future. Nationwide, estimates are that 63% of American jobs will require some level of post-secondary education or training by 2018, and in North Dakota, we aren't exempt. As a matter of fact, a stunning 70% of the jobs in this state are estimated to require post-secondary education by 2018. I'll remind you, that's only six years off. Obviously, my family didn't enjoy a long tradition of valuing higher education. They didn't even enjoy the opportunity for it. But they supported me going to college and having the potential for a better life. And there, I found my academic niche and the life-changing experience that higher education can represent. My life and how I define it, and in fact, how I see the world around me, have forever changed. More importantly, nobody in my extended family could help but notice and be profoundly moved by the transition that took place in me. That was so much the case that every sibling and every cousin after me has pursued at least an undergraduate degree. Think about that. In one lifetime, an entire extended family's potentials have been completely changed as a result of higher education. That is why higher education is so important to me and to those it impacts, sometimes whether they realize it or not. There are few, if any, activities in life that can contribute more to us as individuals, but more importantly, to the people around us. It is an honor to work in higher education settings 
and an honor to be a part of our work at one of the nation's top-ranked, student-focused, land-grant research universities. We are today accomplishing and contributing more for our state and nation than ever before in history, and our most important work is still ahead. Thank you for being a part of an increasingly important contribution to our state, our nation, and the world. You are what's going to make that change happen.